Welcome to this biobrief. It is a privilege to have the opportunity to share this exciting case with you. My name is Dr. Vinay Bide. I'm a periodontist. I work primarily in private practice in Aurora, Ontario, where a large part of my practice is devoted to periodontal plastic surgical therapies. I also teach part-time in the graduate periodontology program at the University of Toronto. The patient seen here is a healthy 60-year-old female who presented with mild to moderate gingival recession affecting teeth 2-2, 2-3, and 2-4. In addition to her concerns of progressive recession, she also had aesthetic concerns and sensitivity of the exposed root surfaces. From the preoperative picture, we can also see evidence of cervical abrasion and erosion. Given the intact intradental soft tissue and normal radiographic bone levels, these can be considered Miller class 1 recessions. I would consider this patient relatively low risk given that she is a healthy, non-smoking individual. As mentioned previously, her recessions are Miller class 1 and thus amenable to 100% root coverage. All affected teeth have at least 2 mm of keratinized gingiva apical to the recession. And last but not least, she has a healthy, stable periodontium and excellent oral hygiene and home care. The desired outcome for this case is complete root coverage which would address all of the patient's chief concerns. She has had soft tissue grafting previously elsewhere in her mouth and was averse to using autogenous tissue, so the option of using an alternative biomaterial like Geislic Fiber Guide was very appealing to her. After gentle scaling and root planing of the exposed root surfaces to remove any debris and root surface prominences, an envelope style split thickness flap was elevated. A vertical releasing incision distal to tooth number 24 was also made. This was done to facilitate mobility of the flap to allow for eventual tension-free coronal advancement and closure of the flap as we shall see momentarily. Great care was taken with tissue handling and flap elevation. The fiber guide was then gently trimmed in its dry state. This primarily involved rounding off the corners for better adaptation. I highly recommend that any modifications made to the fiber guide be done in the dry state as it is much easier to trim with scissors or a scalpel. The matrix is then hydrated with saline solution, and the expansion of the fiber guide is noticeable instantly as it swells up with the saline solution. Careful handling of the fiber guide is paramount at this stage so as to keep it intact and to prevent tearing. The fiber guide was then placed over the exposed root surfaces and extended over the periosteum apically. In this particular case, no attempt was made to secure the fiber guide with sutures. The volume stability of the material helps to keep it nicely in place. And having said that, I do secure the fiber guide in the vast majority of cases where I use it for root coverage. And for this, I typically use a 5-0 or 4-0 chromic gut interrupted suture. Finally, an internal horizontal periosteal releasing incision was made for facilitating coronal advancement of the buccal flap and to allow for complete coverage of the fiber guide material and tension-free primary closure was then achieved using 5-0 monocryl sutures in a modified continuous sling fashion. The short-term healing was interesting in that there was a slight exposure of the fiber guide at one week postoperatively which led to soft tissue dehiscence. This dehiscence spontaneously healed over time and was resolved by four weeks postoperatively. In this four-month postoperative picture, we can see complete root coverage and excellent tissue maturation. These excellent results have been sustained over six months postoperatively and all of the patient's chief complaints have been addressed, and that too with minimal postoperative discomfort and morbidity as compared to the traditional approaches using autogenous tissue. The success of this case can be attributed to optimal case selection, an ideal patient with an ideal defect, and of course, operator experience. Careful recipient site preparation and handling of the biomaterial is extremely important. And as with all root coverage procedures, complete coverage of the grafted tissue or biomaterial and tension-free coronal advancement and closure is mandatory. Diligent post-operative monitoring of the patient along with atraumatic oral hygiene are also key factors for success in the long term. I hope you have found this case interesting and that you might consider using FibroGuide in root coverage procedures as an alternative to autogenous tissues in appropriate cases. Thank you for your time.